Well, welcome everyone to Fascial Counterstrain 101. My name is Kyle Kusinose. I'm a physical therapist out in San Diego, California, and a counterstrain specialist. Uh, I've had the privilege of traveling around the world with Brian and helping him teach his techniques over the past six years or so now. Um, and I'm here today, you know, one, just like you guys, to learn something from Brian, because every time I talk to him, I inevitably learn something new that he's come up with, um, but also to help guide this conversation so that we make sure that you guys as brand new uh, students or potential brand new students get all of your questions uh, answered. Um, this information that we're going to give to you guys over the next hour is typically something that you would get in the Fascial Foundations course, which is the entry level course for the Fascial Counterstrain Curriculum. Um, that course is coming up here in a couple of months, April 16th through 18th. Um, we do have some seats left in those courses in San Diego, um, Whidbey Island, Washington, and St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, because of the, uh, the current landscape and the technology capabilities that we have now that we were forced to come up with last year, um, we thought instead of waiting for the foundations course, why not try and give you guys this material, uh, this content um, remotely uh, in your homes, in your offices, um, and kind of control the initial um, experience or, or the initial um, meat um, of this technique. And uh, there's no one better to do that than the developer of Fascial Counterstrain, Brian Tucky, who's with us here tonight. So thank you, Brian, for being here. And I'll give you the opportunity to introduce yourself. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Again, I'm Brian Tuckey. I'm a PT OCS who lives and practices on the East Coast of the United States. I'm a board certified physical therapist in outpatient physical therapy with 30 years of outpatient orthopedic and manual therapy experience. Um, I'm one of only four physical therapists that was ever certified to teach classic strain counter strain, Dr. Jones's technique by him before he died. And as Kyle said, I developed uh, the modern version of counter strain, which basically has taken the number of techniques from approximately 200 techniques in Dr. Jones's day and expanded it to over 800 different techniques and diagnostic locations. So jumping right in here, Brian, because I know we want to, um, we want to kind of immediately get to some before and after pictures and videos um, so that you guys can see the end product, the total impact of this technique. But uh, for those that don't know, what is fascial counterstrain? So yeah, fascial counterstrain, again, it's an expansion of Dr. Jones's original work of strain and counterstrain, which came from the osteopathic community. And basically it's an indirect form of manipulation, which means that we don't engage barriers, we don't stretch things, we decompress tissues, deactivate nociceptors and drain inflammation from those tissues. It is a multi-system form of manipulation, which allows us to address pain receptors in all tissues, not just musculoskeletal. So yes, we treat the musculoskeletal system, but we break that down into all its components. So we'll work on the nociceptors related to cartilage, related to ligaments, related to the myofascia. We will treat the nociceptors of the vasculature via the tunica adventitia. We're treating arteries and veins. We're treating the visceral nociceptors. And you know this work then allows us to identify areas of stasis and pain um, that really elude all other forms of diagnostics, including uh, most forms of manual therapy and surely the diagnostics that you get from your primary care physician. You touched on kind of our three main selling points, or at least the common three main selling points that I talk about when I um, talk to, to counter-strain students. Um, but that's it. Counter-strain is indirect, that it's multi-system, and that it's really, at its truest form, just applied anatomy. Um, so talk for those that, that don't know about indirect manipulation versus direct manipulation. What's the difference? And counter-strain being direct, why, why is that potentially more powerful and have that carried over uh, which is one of the most important aspects of counter strain is the carryover that we get with our techniques that direct techniques don't have. Well, the, uh, an adequate answer to that question would get into some of the science of it, which I want to, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves until you've actually seen a few things, but what the science is telling us now is that 
really all these reflex arcs, the muscle guarding reflexes that we all treat, whether you're calling it a loss of range of motion, uh, you know, an area of, of hypertonicity, a trigger point, what have you, is really due to stasis. It's really due to inflammatory stasis that's trapped in the tissue. Now, there are lots of receptors that you can use to try and relax this muscle guarding. Um, you can do it directly by trying to force through it, creating some Golgi tendon inhibition through uh, tremendous amounts of force. You can do a high velocity manipulation, get a burst of mechanoreceptor inhibition, inhibition, try and knock that down. Or you can indirectly slack in the involved tissue, relax it, and let all that inflammation drain out. The beauty of indirect, which uses that decompression, is that it's 100% painless. It also can be used on any tissue at any tissue depth. And that is a tremendous advantage over other techniques. It also is why it has extreme and, and really uh, without a re-injury permanent carryover each release because it has the time allotted to allow all that interstitial stasis to go away. If you do something quickly or you create more inflammation with your technique, you might get a little bit of inhibition, but it will come back because you have to get rid of that underlying tissue stasis. So we, we looked a couple of days ago at, at a flow that you were working on and kind of all of the different mechanisms all funneled down to congestion being kind of the end result. So we're basically decongesting inflammation, uh, inflammatory chemicals, um, chemical wastes out of every single tissue at every single depth from the uh, superficial layers of the fascia all the way down to skeletal, uh, the skeletal system. Yeah, exactly. So if we look at the nociceptors, what tissues have pain receptors, if you don't know what that word means, or nociceptors, virtually all tissues, okay? So with the exception of maybe, maybe hyaline cartilage, um, you know, and deep inside, say, you know, your liver and certain organs, you know, every tissue has a nociceptor. Therefore, it can be one of these pain generators. And where uh, the people go wrong is that they're assuming that the pain generator is always a musculoskeletal tissue. And what happens is if you have a pain generator due to an area of stasis, let's say in the mesentery of the viscera, and that is creating a reflex tightening of the hamstrings through convergence, which we'll talk about in a second, and you stretch those hamstrings and treat those hamstrings, you'll get about 25 minutes of relaxation of those hamstrings and it will come back because you're treating the musculoskeletal component, which is simply a muscle guarding mechanism for this other nociceptor feeding into the same segment of the spine. Right, right. Well, um, I mean, that actually segues almost perfectly into the, the videos that you wanted to show. Um, so maybe we just jump right into some of the before and after cases here. Yeah, go figure. I didn't plan that. So uh, let's see here. So let's pull up the screen here. This is for you guys, one of the uh, videos out of the fascial intro class. Um, what Kyle said to you is, you know, basically we're taking tiny little pieces out of that first class just to give you an idea of what you'll learn in the class. And this is one of the videos that we show at the beginning, just to give you a taste of how the technique works. So if we hop in here, what you're going to see, um, let's do this, uh, share, okay. What you're going to see here is a presentation of a gentleman. Let me see if I can get this uh, full screen here for you. Okay, so this particular gentleman had multiple prior surgeries. He had previous physical therapy, even including some counter strain. Um, he started in a wheelchair and through the practitioner that treated him previously, who was a fascial counter strain practitioner, got him out of the wheelchair, um, but he had plateaued. So she sent him to me for some additional treatment. And I just shot, had one of my staff shoot the original video, um, just so you see exactly how he came in and exactly how he leaves. <clears throat> So let's just run this through and let you, let you listen. This morning has had multiple surgeries in his back. Has had quite a bit of counter strain uh, performed. Uh, the viscera is clear, several other systems are clear, but he is a pretty strong musculo ligamentous uh, pattern. And we're gonna see how poor his motion is in flexion and strength. So go ahead, Ben, spend forward to your fill tightness. 
This is Garrison. Okay, move you around your back there, you start to unpain everything. Okay, so you can see that's not quite where you want to be. One more time, again, which, what do you have comfortably? Okay, and you feel that through the back, hamstrings, everywhere? Yes. Okay, all right. And go ahead and lay your back there. We'll check the straight leg raise. And then we just check the straight leg raise. He looks, he has about 45 degrees. He's already wincing there. Right about there? Yeah. Okay, maybe actually it's about 30 degrees. Our straight leg raise. And the other side. Right there. Okay, all right. And so you have, you've had laminectomies at a one, two, three, four, and five. Two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. One's the only one left. One's left, okay, all right, thank you. Okay, so it's about 25 minutes later, and what we found were anterior longitudinal ligament dysfunctions in the lumbar spine, posterior longitudinal ligament uh, dysfunctions, and some pretty severe lower extremity muscle chains uh, all the way down into the ankles. And then we're gonna reassess his straight leg raise and trunk motion. So you tell me when, Vince, if you have any, any pain. I'm gonna bring it up again. Good. Still good? Yep. Okay. And yeah, right about there. There. Okay. Definitely better? Mm hmm Okay, all right. Good, I'll come back down. So that was about 30, and we were about 80. And then the other side was a little better, about 40. And we're gonna bring this up. No, I'm still free. Okay. That one's all the way up to 90, yep. all right. Excellent. How long has it been since you had that kind of motion? Can't remember. Can't remember? So before the first surgery probably. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's see how your trunk motion is. When was the last time you could bend all the way over? Can't remember. Can't remember. Okay, well, let's see what you can do. How you feel? Good. Good, no pain? Nope. And so just a little hamstring maybe? Mm-hmm. All right, put your hands down, see how far you can go. So. Wow. So that was even more than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> all right, I'll stand. Okay. Okay, we're six weeks later back with uh, Vincent after his last treatment. Um, he reports maintaining all the motion improvement and has returned for one little spot on his right iliac crest. Uh, we're just gonna show you a pre-treatment uh, range of motion uh, test to show that the gains were maintained. So go ahead uh, and bend forward for me. And there he goes, and let's see, can you touch the ground for us? All the way down to the fingertips. Excellent, and come back. And what did you feel there? Nothing. Nothing. Good. So, all right. Great. Thank you. All right. Kyle, can you, can you hear me, Kyle? Yep. yep. Okay. So for those of you watching, a couple of things I want you to, to note there. Uh, first of all, that was a one session uh, change, and that was a pre-treatment. This blue shirt view here is a pre-treatment uh, outcome six weeks later after one session. So that's what we meant by um, carryover, <clears throat> those hamstrings uh, were secondary to the ligamentous dysfunction that was holding him in an extended moment. And there was some myofascial involvement, but it was all treated indirectly. <clears throat> the other thing is that the technique, again, um, is indirect, it is painless. So someone in severe pain or elderly or even children, you're able to utilize the technique without fear of any type of exacerbation or, or really, you know, hurting them and having them not want to seek further treatment. Now that's a kind of an orthopedic case, but because this paradigm is multi-system, we can treat because of some of the convergence we'll talk about, uh, vessel spasm as well. So all the different tissues, the smooth muscle tissues, the skeletal muscle tissues and all the pain receptors, they meet in the spinal cord at the same place. And there are what are called somatosympathetic reflexes which means the nociceptors from your muscles, ligaments, all that kind of stuff can kick in the sympathetic nervous system at the same segment. That creates vessel spasm, vasospasm. So when you start to treat vasospasm, you can see things change that are beyond the world of pain. So for example, I came in. let's go to this particular gentleman right here. And he has what's called an intention tremor, which is a cerebellar tremor. Every time you go to move, you can't maintain your cerebellar balance in your brain and you basically have no stability and, and no coordination. Um, this is a 20 year history of a cerebellar a tremor. <clears throat> and this gentleman, again, you'll see a series of basically two or three sessions here. And you can see 
this cerebellar tremor, which is 20 years old, gradually decrease each session. Uh, you also see the carryover after each session is beyond where he left. And the way I targeted this was I basically targeted the vertebro uh venous complex at the base of the skull, decreased all that vasospasm, took the pressure out of the area of the cerebellum, and that's what changed this long-standing cerebellar tremor. So let's go back and there we go. I'll go ahead and, and reach up for me. Okay, just gonna take a look at it, I'm sure. All right, pretty good. And back down. All right, so so let's go back one more time real after. quick. And I want you to look at the and, and, and arm at the other me. side as well. Look at the entire Let's arm shaking. I'm sure. Left arm, whole thing is shaking. Okay. All right, very good. Okay. And back down. All right. All right. So this is Donald now after. This is after 15 minutes of work on the basilar venous complex. And definitely straighter on the left. Already starting the to decrease in the tremor. Still some tremor there, but good and steady now on the left. I feel a little better, Donald. Yes, the left is better. Your left is better, and yeah, and I think the amount of the right is a little slower, a little steadier. Okay, excellent. Right, this is Donald back after the first visit, and we're going to check his his tremors beforehand. Go ahead and reach up there for Donald. This is. And there we are, pretty solid. We can have later no additional time. treatment. This was just so additional this has been drainage. About a week and a half since our first session, and some pretty good carryover, maybe even some improvement beyond. <laughs> So we're going to work on some more and uh, see how that does. He is still having some problems writing, but that's clearly a different than our first day. All right, outstanding. Okay, and then we six weeks later. Six weeks now, uh, post. And we're just taking a look here at the tremors, and they are rock solid. And uh, we have some continued work to do with improvement of writing but outstanding carryover from. All right, so let's, so basically uh, the thing about that video that is somewhat comical is that he wore the same clothes to every session, but it was uh, three different treatment sessions. He had his PT clothes, but those are two quick examples of some of the scope of the technique. So again, one being a predominantly vascular based disorder, one being more of an orthopedic based disorder. Right. So the, the first guy that, uh, that you saw, you know, he ended up being, by the time he got to you, a, a musculoskeletal type patient, right? Because you primarily treated spinal ligaments on him. Mm -hmm. uh, but prior to that, he started out a multi-system mess. Uh, I'm sure it's just those, those systems got cleaned up prior to you. Yeah. According to uh, Christine Wood in Virginia, who sent him to me, his predominant presentation when he was still in the wheelchair was visceral. The visceral mm -hmm. nociceptors were the worst. <clears throat> so he had made a significant amount of improvement before he came to me. And that is, again, that's another concept that you're gonna have to learn as you go through the curriculum is that all these different pain uh, centers and sources, again, converge in one or two areas. And you know each technique, being able to treat the viscera versus the vascular system versus the musculoskeletal system, you know, peels off a layer and allows you to get to that point where the person is symptom free. If you only have skills in one system, you're gonna have your successes. You know, a, a person's gonna come in who's, who is articular based and you're a manipulator and they're gonna be in your wheelhouse and you're gonna be like, yes, you know, I'm the man. Um, but if someone who has visceral fascia dysfunction comes in and you're articular based and you manipulate that joint. And I can tell you, I've had chiropractic, I've had patients who I was able to, to alleviate their symptoms in one to two visits who had had several hundred chiropractic manipulations. And I literally asked them, I said, why did you keep going back? And they said, because I got some relief for a while. But that's out of your wheelhouse if you only have articular techniques and you don't have visceral techniques. So this curriculum allows you to assess the person from a multi-system paradigm, turning off, shutting off, uh, basically decompressing and draining inflammation to hit it from many different arenas. Yeah, another a cool thing about the, the uh forward bend patient is, uh, you know, we saw like an immediate change and then amazing carryover. Uh, and then the second patient, the tremor patient, we saw probably not immediate change immediately after the visit, but what you did was created an environment that got 
drainage going, got blood flow return going. Uh, and then we just gave the body time to heal. Um, so we're, we're really kicking off this, the, the body's innate healing um, process, which allows not only just change over time, but like massive amounts of improvement over time in some of these patients. Yeah, so, so that's a good point, Kyle, in that um, this technique attempts to, and usually does get to the, to the source of the problem. We're not treating the symptoms. So if we get to that source of that impaired healing or that venous stasis, which is that sympathetic overdrive, and we you know, drain the nociceptive drive via inflammation that is causing that, we improve, the word you're looking for is perfusion. We, we improve perfusion, right. which is blood in and blood out. And that can be decompression of something giving you know, weird neurological signals or pain, or blood flow in can promote healing in a non-healing state. Right. So a lot of the lecturing that I do, I, I do to either new physical therapists or physical therapy students. And in person, you could show them a miracle and, and they still ask you, well, what is this evidence-based? Um, you know, what's the research behind this now? Um, so I know as much time as you've devoted to development of the techniques, uh, maybe over the last five, maybe 10 years, you've put more and more effort into being in the research, in the literature, um, and um, developing the physiologic rationale for counter strain. So um, is the science at a place where it's adequately explaining what we're doing with counter strain and is counter strain backed by science? Is it evidence-based? So the way this technique has progressed is simply a twofold. Number one, I constantly read tissue science and I constantly read pain science, okay? Article after article, I have people all over the world who send me articles. Hey, Brian, have you seen this one? So, you know, I'm very, very up to date on all those articles uh, going back, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, then I take what I've learned in the research and then I'm in the trenches every day. I still treat patients 40 to 50 hours a week and I apply these concepts, you know, to the real setting and I try out my various theories um, and it's allowed me to expand it to areas that I honestly just am kind of shocked we're treating today as far as in the brain and the endocrine system and and some things that, you know, I wouldn't have dreamed were possible in the past. Uh, currently, I just spent, like today, I had a snow day here in the East Coast. And from 4.45 this morning, uh, up until right about the time I logged in, I am working on uh, a research paper with two of the experts in pain science around the world. One is uh, Dr. J.P. Shah from National Institute of Health and uh, uh, Dr. John uh, Cerbelli, who is from Canada, the University of Guelphie. And these two guys are actually authors of the two prevailing pain models. One is called the neurogenic model and one is called the integrative model. And they're involved in both of those. Um, these guys are on the paper with me developing this multi-system model, which is a progression of those models. So yes, this is more science than most people want based. Um, and the rationale itself is is really cutting edge, of, you know, to simplify things. Yeah. So the, another selling point you know, we talked about: counter strain being indirect, gentle on the patient, gentle on the practitioner, and then the benefits of indirect. Um, another selling selling point being that counter strain is multi-system, and we've talked about that a little bit already. The prevailing paradigm right now is the musculoskeletal paradigm. So. You know, what are the shortcomings of the musculoskeletal paradigm? What are the, the misconceptions around that? Um, and where does fascial counterstrain come in to you know, help out with patients that aren't getting better with the musculoskeletal paradigm? Well, this, that's probably a twofold question. Number one, if we look at it from the perspective of pain, you know, they're missing many of the nociceptors that are non-musculoskeletal. Okay, so again, if we've got some uh, an inflammatory source that is visceral or an inflammatory source that is vascular or an inflammatory source that is uh, musculoskeletal but not treated very often like a deep spinal ligament, you know, you're gonna be up the neurological chain and just treating the superficial muscle tension and, you know, massaging or rubbing or, you know, you know needling. Um, and then you can have those patients uh, really not respond long-term. Your, your benefit will be short-lived. Yeah. The, the other aspect is that there are all types of idiopathic conditions that aren't necessarily related to pain. And this can happen because you can get 
some of the sympathetic activation and vascular uh, pain receptors are mechano pain receptors. They're kind of silent. The only time they create pain is if typically there's other pain receptors at the same spinal level that are already exciting that landing zone. So you can get silent vasospasm and silent venous you know, spasm that creates other conditions. So uh, you could get, for example, uh, edema, you know, a chronic ankle edema that never resolved or lymphedema. You know, you can get stuff like that tremor. Okay. So he wasn't a pain patient, but that was venous stasis. You know, you can have uh, peripheral neuropathies where the nerve is starved of blood supply. So it starts to degenerate. Uh, all these areas of silent degeneration in the spine. You know, we know in the research, you have areas where it just starts to degenerate, yet that particular segment isn't necessarily painful uh, in many patients, but why is it degenerating? Once again, you have this silent vascular problem. You know, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, you know, we could go on with these syndromes that are idiopathic, idiopathic fibrosis. And this technique allows you to go in there and say, okay, let me, let me take a look at the perfusion, you know? What is going on with that? The person with um, HP axis excitation, hypothalamus, pituitary adrenal, you know, the, you know, basically fight or flight. Let's look at the adrenal gland. Let's look at the adrenal artery, adrenal veins, sympathetics at the T11. You know, let's go to the area of the sphenoid and hypothalamus and let's check out all the anatomy, as you said, anatomy approach in those structures that are dysfunctional and malfunctioning. So that's what this paper is. We're trying to really focus in on because that's kind of the, the untapped area of how could this multi-system paradigm really explain so many of these, uh, what are called idiopathic conditions that nobody is treating. Then for, you know, for the, this traditional orthopedic therapist too, someone who comes in, a patient that comes in visceral primary, vascular primary, neural primary, they're still gonna have somatic pain complaints. Maybe not always, yes. but yeah. a lot of them will still have somatic pain complaints too, right? That if you are not addressing those non-musculoskeletal systems, that's going to be a field patient for you. Yeah, you know, exactly. So what visceral pain, when I say visceral pain, everyone's like, well, I don't have patients that come in and say my belly hurts. Right. Okay. Right. But what you have to understand is there's a no C autonomic reflex. So the muscle, the guarding reflex kicks in and that pain is perceived as musculoskeletal. So the pleura will give you mediocapular pain. Okay. Uh, so you go down and you get a, the viscera tends to project to the sacroiliac joint. Um, the, the viscera of the bladder and the colon converge in the hamstrings, give you a limited straight leg raise, low back pain. So basically, if you treat, you know, mediocapular pain, shoulder pain, low back pain, sacroiliac pain, tight hamstrings, sciatica, you treat visceral patients. You just yeah. think they're musculoskeletal. Right, right. Yep. Third talking point, applied anatomy, um, which, you know, this is the thing that I love the most about chemistry because I'm an anatomy guy, this is the way that I think. Um, but you call FCS, uh, uh, fascia chemistry, an anatomical model of manipulation. What, what do you mean by that? How, how, what does that look like clinically? So in, in the early days when Dr. Jones taught me the technique, you know, they were neuromuscular tender points and we did not have exact uh, anatomical, you know, correlations. So we basically called them sensory manifestations of a neuromuscular dysfunction. And we knew if we decompressed the body into a certain position, we could turn them off. Dr. Jones was correct. And he said that you know, a lot of these aren't muscles. We were always trying to kind of think of a muscle, but he would say, you know, they, they can't be all muscles. And what, what it turns out is they're all tissues that are related to the fascial system, but fascia is in all systems. It's all structures. It makes up all structures. So what I've done is I've gone back through and through a complex process of, you know, assessing vectors and some things we don't have time to explain, basically figured out the anatomical correlation to each one of these points. Okay. Which point is associated with the subclavian artery? Which one is the subclavian vein? You know, which point relates to the anchoring structures of the, of the bladder, ligamentous structures? You know, which one is the ileocecal valve? Um, which one relates to the annulus of the disc. So it's an anatomical model. The beauty of it is if we see the person has a problem and let's say you look up someone who has an idiopathic uh, problem related to drainage of the eye. You know, we can say, okay, well, let's check out the ophthalmic veins. Let's check out the ophthalmic artery. Let's check the sympathetics to C1. 
let's right. look at the anatomy related to that eye and let's fix what we find. Yeah. So it's a it's a hundred percent anatomical model. If you don't like anatomy, don't come in. Because it, <laughs> it's yeah. all anatomy. Yeah. It's so cool. And it's such a fun way to treat and to think about the body and to diagnose your patients. Because you don't have to go into such an advanced medical model. It's just the simple anatomy that's right there in front of you and we can treat it in 45 to 90 seconds. Yeah, and what it does is it really instills confidence. Even in the, in the early days with Dr. Jones, we had 200 releases. Again, um, I knew that I had a tool that was never used on that patient before. So I didn't really care who they saw. I mean, I, I was you know five years out, but I, I trained with Dr. Jones. I mean, I knew stuff that I knew clinicians that were out 20 years they couldn't do, they weren't using indirect and they didn't have this tool. So I was like, yeah, let, let me try. And I had, you know, success very early on and, and things that were failed cases with a fraction of what we know today. So you kind of get excited for these chronic patients because, you know, you're the first one that's looking at it from a multi-system paradigm. You're the first one to find their pain and they, they're, you know, they cry. I mean, how many times have you had that happen, Kyle? When you, when you put your finger on, you're like this, and they're like, oh my God, that's the spot. And I've, no one's found this and everyone thinks I'm crazy and they want me to see a psychiatrist and they just start to cry on the national and the eval and you haven't even started working on them. Right, yeah, yeah, they've actually been prescribed antidepressants and shown the door and that, that was it. Medical system was done with them, so. Yeah, and that's a key point is, you know, that we're not disparaging the medical model, but the thing about neuromuscular dysfunction and the stasis is that there is no diagnostic that is not done in an experimental sense that shows it. So you can run an MRI, you can run an X-ray, and essentially this type of dysfunction does not show up. It needs a palpatory exam from an expert. Um, you can do interstitial sampling with a microdialysis needle, and that's what Dr. Shah's specialty is. Um, so you can find the stasis, and you can use diagnostic ultrasound and see the stasis in the muscle trigger point. It's been done so far. But there is nothing that you're going to have your primary doctor run that's going to show this. So many people get uh, thrown into the bucket of malingerer or, you know, basically a psychiatric condition. Yeah. So you, you've been mentioning Dr. Jones, you got your start with Dr. Jones, um, taking courses from him. And then um, he certified you to start teaching uh, his techniques. And then how did you stumble into this world of this multi-system world and, and start uh, putting together all the different system techniques that you have? Uh, you know, like, most cases of uh, failure led to, you know, basically a revelation. So I had a patient that came in with an apparent quadratus lumborum dysfunction. Uh, you know, again, I was probably five, six years out and the therapists in the area were already sending me all the toughest cases. And this patient came in and she was a therapist herself. And, and I was like, oh, you know, I, I think I can probably help you, you know, and so let me go ahead and unlock the quadratus. And so I did a bunch of stuff that, that we knew. And, you know, three or four sessions later, she was no better. Um, so I could feel the tension in the area of the QL and the 11th rib, 12th rib, that whole area. And I'm like, I tried, went back to direct techniques because I've trained in high velocity, muscle energy, uh, direct mobilization, nerve gliding. I, I trained in all that stuff as well. I tried all kinds of stuff, tried to beat it into submission. Finally, I just said, look, I, I don't know what this is. Um, I said, I do, however, know a guy in, in Baltimore it was one of my original mentors who told me to go osteopathic route, by the way, when I volunteered for him in high school. Yeah. And, and I said, I said, I know a guy who knows visceral stuff and some other systems of osteopathy that, you know, might be able to help you. I have no idea, but I don't know what else to tell you. So she said, give me his name. I'll go. So she went out and saw Tom. And last thing I said to her is if this guy manages to help you, please come back and tell me what the heck he did. And she came back about two weeks later and said that she went two times and she's pain free. I was like, you know, what did he do? And she said, it was my kidney, it was my kidney fascia. And, you know, I just thought about the area of the pain by the QL, 12th, 11th river. I'm like, holy crap, that was the kidney. Um, so I started studying in visceral manipulation through the French and, you know, Brawl and, and some other people and learned to go down to that depth of tissue, motion test the viscera, and, and I just found this whole world of motion restriction and sensitivity that was not being addressed by the points we had in the curriculum with Dr. Jones. So it turns out, fast forward, um, I gradually developed how to turn off all these visceral 
ligaments and, and associated structures, found diagnostic points for them. It took me seven years yeah. just to get that one system to, to be mapped out. Um, I wasn't very good at it back then. It took me seven full years. But I eventually came up with about you know, 50, 50 tender points that were unique and they were visceral structures. And, but I used Dr. Jones's uh, position of ease philosophy. And that was the first course. But it sent me down the road of, let's look at tissues that aren't musculoskeletal, okay? And I started studying fascia. When I was first lecturing about fascia, you know, everybody was like, come on, dude, really fascia? You know, it's just structural. Uh, now it's fascia everything all over the place, you know, you know 30 years later. But uh, I was like, no, no, it's a proprioceptive organ. And, and um, the first study that said that it was proprioceptive and it had pain fibers, you know, hadn't come out yet. And I actually called Dr. Shah and I, I, cause he's involved in all the research. I said, Dr. Shah, is there any evidence to show that fascia is contractile? And he emailed me back. He's like, why do you ask? I said, because it is. <laughs> because, you know, I'm feeling it and I'm decompressing and I'm, I'm fixing it. And he yeah. shot back several months later, the original studies that showed that uh, fascia had myofibroblasts and it was in fact contractile. Yeah, right. The other uh, word that you're saying is convergence. Yeah, so okay, so convergence, if we go back to the slide here, um, and this is just a really kind of simple neurological concept uh, that we can talk about here. You got that slide, Kyle? I'm not seeing it, you're okay, not sharing. Right Let's share a screen here. Okay, here we go. So if we come down here, um, first of all, this is again, one of the slides from the class. It just shows the different types of, of fascia and they all have histologically similar you know, structure with muscle fascia, visceral fascia, like a parietal sequel ligament. There's your ileocecal valve, all these fascial structures blending into the viscera. And then of course, the tunica adventitia of all your vessels, it's all deep fascia, nociceptors, stretch receptors, it's all really a similar tissue. But if we go down a few slides here, this is what I wanted to show you guys. Um, when I talk about convergence, I mean that at one level of the spine, this is the spinal cord, pain receptors from muscle fascia, vessel, fascia and organ fascia all come together. And then they stimulate, they go into the dorsal horn, they, they dump certain chemicals in there that makes the dorsal horn more sensitive, which is again, central sensitization. If you guys have heard that, it, it sensitizes the spinal cord. And each one of these areas of stasis and activated nociceptors make it much more likely that we will exceed the inhibitory chemicals coming down the spinal cord from the brain, and we will be able to fire that secondary neuron to experience pain. So they converge in one spot and then they can go up. Now what happens is there is what's called the dorsal root reflex. It was discovered in the 90s. And all this inflammation that comes in goes into the dorsal root ganglia. And the dorsal root ganglia responds in a very unique fashion it sends inflammation back out all the nerves that converge there, that meet there. So one really nasty, say visceral fascia, ileocecal inflammation can create neurogenic retrograde inflammation that shows up everywhere else in that convergent group. So what you can get is inflammation and tightness in a muscle, a muscle tender point or trigger point that is simply secondary to its convergent visceral friend that is really in bad shape. So that's why when we go to look at the muscle spot, we don't really know, you know, is the muscle the cause or is it just responding through this retrograde inflammation from one of these other convergent structures? And the connection that's missing on that picture too is also the connection to skin, right? Yeah, absolutely. The skin would be the tender point, right? Okay, that skin is the tender point. So exactly, cutaneous for every visceral uh, and musculoskeletal and really vascular as well, pain receptor, there is a convergent skin location. And that's what makes our diagnostic tender point. So what I've done over 30 years and about 80,000 hours, and I did the calculation, was to map out all of those tender points and what they mean inside. So like Dr. Jones <clears throat> started in 1955 when he kind of had his 
first serendipitous discovery. And it took him like 30, 40 years to develop his 185 techniques. It took you seven years to put your visceral course together. And now I, I kind of imagine this big crossword puzzle that is slowly being filled in. And the more filled in it gets, the easier, you know, because you have hints and clues, the easier it gets to come up with certain answers. Uh, so now you have how many systems, how many, how many classes? Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, basically there's subsystems, but your, your basic systems are your musculoskeletal, your neural, your visceral, okay, and then your vascular systems, which are the lymphatic venous and arterial system. But there are subsystems. So the, you know, uh, the neurological classes have somatics that go to, you know, your muscles and skin. Autonomics, we have, the auto we treat the sympathetic nervous system, we treat the parasympathetic nerves like the vagus nerve. And then of course you have dura, meninges. So we treat those nociceptors and tissues as well. So each one of them has its own signs and symptoms, um, allowing us again to expand the scope of what we do for a living, um, you know, to, to a pretty, pretty incredible, uh, you know, array of things that we can treat. And I wouldn't just say that the number of patients, I would say allows us to really address the person's complaints, all that they have. So they may come in initially with a problem that was uh, low back pain. And then we realize that that L1-2 convergence is also affecting their bladder urgency or their constipation. It's the same segment for yeah. which they were seeing a different doctor. You're, the, you're, the, you're just the low back guy, but you're, oh, you know, in the process, you're like, well, I see bladder nociceptors feeding into L1-2. I see visceral nociceptors feeding into L1-2. And when we turn down all that input, relax those somatosympathetic reflexes, peristalsis starts to go back again, blood supply goes down. You're not stuck in that state of fight or flight neurologically. And wow, voila, your multiple sy uh, systems and symptoms get better. You really, you know, people come in all the time, patients that, uh, you know, I've seen years and they're like, you know, how are you with kidneys and how are you it does get to the point where they start asking you to treat stuff. They're like, no, I actually cannot help that. I cannot right. help that. Yeah. Well, if you are, uh, if you missed it in the beginning, if you kind of come on in the last few minutes here, um, the entry level course into the curriculum Brian was just describing is the fascial foundations course. Um, we're teaching it for the first time this year on uh, April 16th through the 18th. And if you are a new student and not registered for the course yet, we are offering a $50 discount uh, to that entry level check out you're going to use the code live hey, Kyle, Kyle, yes you lag there you might have to say that again oh did i lag yeah the last last few seconds okay um we are offering a discount code if you are a new student the code is live 50 l-i-v-e uh, 50 if you are a new student registering registering for the fascial foundations course um on april 16th through the 18th uh this year um i wanted to talk about the question uh, what type of therapist or healthcare practitioner um, would really thrive with uh, with this technique? Um, and the way that I look at it is there are, you know, kind of your extrinsic or objective um, therapists, and then your there's your intrinsic or kind of subjective uh, types of therapists. So for extrinsic reasons, and you and I have done some marketing events together um, where we talk to a therapist walking by and go, are you interested in manual therapy? And they go, oh no, I'm, I'm a neuro, uh, I'm a neuro PT. Or, um, you know, hey, interested in manual therapy? Oh no, I do PETs. So why are those therapists wrong to think that way? Why are they, um, you know, how is counter-strain actually perfect for their patient population in the setting they're in, even though they don't think it is? Yeah, so it all comes down to anatomy, dysfunctional anatomy, okay? If, if it's pathologically damaged or it's genetic, nobody's fixing it. So what it is, is you have dysfunction that might be neural, vascular, musculoskeletal, and that's what you, we fix. This anatomical model allows us to do that. So I treat a tremendous amount of peds, okay? So uh, developmental delay and, and all types of speech issues. And really, to be honest, I go in and I just decompress the cranial base. I work on the dura. I work on areas of the cranium. And it's, it's dramatic how fast these kids start to speak again. Um, they just catch up in their delay. It, it's it's kind of interesting because they're always in speech therapy and other therapies. 
And I always tell the, the parent, I said, don't, don't tell your therapist that you came here. And it's usually the speech therapist within one session will be like, something happened, something's changed. Um, because the, the kid's you know, neurological system is impaired, it's dysfunctional, and they're trying to develop around these impairments. If, if you can go into the world of wound healing, okay? Uh, yeah. Someone who's, whose wound is not healing, it's a problem of perfusion. So let's check all the blood supply into that leg. Let's check the venous drainage into that leg. Let's decre uh, decompress the myofascial tone around that leg. Let's fix the sympathetic nerve activation that causes vasoconstriction. And let's open up all that stuff and let's see what happens. Well, it's pretty, it's pretty dramatic. And so unless you, uh, again, have something that's incurable, you know, I, this is an anatomical model is something you could apply to any patient. I think the places where you could struggle would maybe be in places where you can't manipulate the patient around and get them to move. Maybe home health could be difficult, uh, you know, trying to you know, navigate around, you know, a bed or something. But basically the anatomy applies to all, all professions. Right. And as a, you know, if you are an orthopedic therapist, um, you know, what you're going to see over time as you get better and better at counseling is that your caseload is going to start turning into you know, non-orthopedic cases. You're going to get the pediatric patient. You're going to get the cardiopulmonary patient uh, or the, the neuro patient that uh, is coming to you for counseling because counseling is going to do for them something that their neurospecialist or cardiopulmonary uh, specialist hasn't yet. Um, and so the two counter strain specialty and the you know, population specialty can really go amazingly well together. And we need more counter strainers um, that not only um, are in those specialties, but also can counter strain their patients at the same time. It just to give you another quick paradigm. It's like when you have this, this paradigm, I use that word because it's a different way of looking at, at, the, at the body. Um, you can look at some common conditions and you'll say, ah, I get it now, like, like post concussion. Someone who has a concussion creates inflammation that inflammation triggers the nociceptors, you get vasospasm, you get venous spasm. This maintains the pressure in the head and the person can get chronic headaches, they can get visual disturbances, they get brain fog, right? Brain fog is just a decrease in cognitive ability. Well, that venous spasm, which was from the trauma, there are very strong homeostatic reflexes. The, artery will, the arteries will soon match because the body won't, won't put in what it can't get out. So like I said, everything starts to deteriorate and let's look at what that is 20, 30 years later, multiple concussions, more nociception. It's CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Now the lymphatic drainage system is impaired. You start to get accumulation of tau proteins. You get degeneration of the brain and it can become permanent. Yeah. So, you know, this early brain fog is really, if you think about it, it's the very first signs of what could potentially become dementia. And it is a vascular phenomenon. So we go in, fix that neurovascular or underlying cause, drain the veins, open everything back up. And not only do the short-term symptoms going away, but I would, I would uh, you know, be confident in saying that we're preventing you know, some pretty future, significant future pathology. Yeah. But and I, and you, could, you could ask me any type of condition, as you know, Kyle, like you said, I, I just go off on things at times. Um, <laughs> and and I, I can tell you the, the physiological you know, anatomical basis of, of so many common conditions because I've mapped it out in the clinic. And I mapped it out by failing enough times till I finally succeeded and I just perfected my little protocol and figured out where it came from. Yeah. But it's by looking at things over and over again, what do all these patients with irritable bowel syndrome all have in common? And yes, do we address diet? Of course we address diet. We, we try and look at it from a holistic perspective, but sure. somebody has to fix this perfusion issue and this elevated sympathetic drive. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next, I think this is a, an interesting question, and this topic always kind of reminds me of John Calipari, who's the head basketball coach at the University of Kentucky, um, one of the best basketball programs in the country. He's always traveling around the country recruiting the elite level high school basketball players to come to Kentucky, and one of his main uh, kind of pitch lines to them is, listen, Kentucky's not for everybody. It's like, if you're going to come to Kentucky, you got to work like this, you got to live like this, you got to sacrifice this. Um, so in the same way, counter strain, it, it's not for everybody. And I think, you know, you and me are, are will you know, happily admit that. Um, but you've traveled around the world. You've taught um, students from, you know, being newbies in the class to seeing them become the best counter strainers in their country, their city, their region, whatever it is. So what are like common, you know, intrinsic traits that you've seen um, 
in therapists that would make them thrive and really enjoy and be passionate about this technique. So, so people who want to get to the root of the cause, if that's your personality, you know, people who are somewhat perfectionists who want to fix things, not just treat things. Um, if you can, on the other side, conversely, if you're someone who doesn't like to take responsibility for the patient, figure out what's going on and just put them through a protocol, then this, this work is not for you. Okay. You know, if you're the kind of person that says, look, I, I gave you the exercises, I did the ultrasound and it, you didn't respond, you know, and if that doesn't bother you, this isn't for you. But if it does bother you to tell the person that you went through everything, you really don't know what's wrong with them. You tried your best but you're gonna to have to discharge them. If that bothers you, then this is the right coursework for you because you know, somewhat of a perfectionist, but the person who wants to get to the anatomical basis of what ails people. And I also will promise you a lifetime of learning, okay? Because I'm 30 years into this and I'm still learning every day. Um, you know, you can catch up very quickly to the level where the elite people are because we have it, you know, the curriculum set for you. You can be elite very quickly um, because it's, it's there for you, but it's, you know, where you'll be one year, two years, five years from now is just exponential growth. If you really will get through it now, is it easy? You know, no, you, you have to go through the classes. You have to study the anatomy. Um, you got to go back to the clinic. You know, you're going to fail as many times as you succeed the first time you have to go back to your old techniques for a while. Um, but you know, you're going to have that wow success. And then you're going to say, okay, that time, you know, the right person came in with, with, it was in my wheelhouse. And as you take more classes, your wheelhouse becomes bigger and bigger. And yep. you'll get exposed to some people like, like yourself, Kyle, or, you know, the instructors you run into and the practitioners. And you watch these people work, you watch how fast they can identify dysfunctional tissue. And you're like, okay, I want to be like that. That's what made me in my first class, because uh, I was studying with multiple people. I always joked that I was kind of speed dating manual therapy, because I really was. Um, I was studying in LV and Butler and Stanley Paris and, and Michigan State. And what impressed me with Jones's work was number one is, you know, he was just doing it indirect and everyone else was going the other direction. Number two, my personal pain matched the diagnostic tender points in that first class. I had a bad shoulder, I had some pseudo sciatica. And when I got to the shoulder lab and, and the hip lab, you know, it lit me up. I also on well, my lab partner in the first class uh, were anterior cervicals, Dr. Jones called them, which turned out to be sympathetic locations, postganglionic sympathetics. Before I released those and my lab partner who had quite a few, I motion tested him. I checked his mobility and I found all types of flex slash FRS restrictions. I treated them and I went back and motion tested it. And it was the most complete improvement. It was the most drastic improvement of segmental mobility I'd ever felt. And I was like, holy crap, this, this stuff is crazy. Um, so even though I wasn't very good at it, I, I just saw that it matched my pain. I saw that it, when I did it correctly, it changed the segmental facilitation. Um, I watched Dr. Jones, how fast he could find things in the body. I watched, uh, Kyle's father, Randy, who's probably got the best hands in the world. Uh, these guys just, you know, I was like, wow, these, these guys are just, you know, so far ahead of me. Uh, and I had spent a lot of money at that point. So, yeah. So, you know, jumping into this curriculum, um, and, and talking to the, practitioner who's considering taking this course, um, you know, what's, what else is kind of in it for them, right? Assuming, and it doesn't matter if they're self-employed, a staff physical therapist at a hospital, you know, assuming that all of our goals are the same, which is to help our patients with their pain, to get them out of pain, to improve their functional limitations. What's kind of in it for, for them short-term and long-term? Well, you're not going to have to jump around curriculums to grow professionally, Okay. You can stay right here with the Jones Institute and fascial counter strain, and you will be a better therapist every six months for pretty much as long as you want to hang out with us. So, you know, professional ongoing growth with that professional growth comes confidence and a, you know, absolutely not undervalued job satisfaction. Okay. We all know our job is based on getting people to feel better, getting range of motion back, and when no one's getting better, your day really stinks. So nobody wants to go through their entire day and say, you know, how are you, Mrs. Jones? I'm really no better. I don't think this is working. You know, you don't want to hear that all day long. It's, it, the job is not very, satisfa you know, very uh, satisfying. So job satisfaction, professional growth, um, you know, really loving what you do, 
you know, understanding what your, really ails your, pa your patients is, is really what you can get as a staff therapist. Because, you know, we all got into healthcare to help people and to have uh, an impact in their life. And this gives you kind of, a, again, a long-term goal uh, of being able to do that in many different conditions. Yeah. And then you know, just looking at fascial counterstrain, kind of a tunnel vision with, on the fascial foundations course, the techniques that they're going to be getting in this class, um, you know, taking them back to the clinic Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the following week, um, you know, how's it going to help them that week, the week after, you know, before they've stacked one, two, three, four courses? Well, first thing is, it is called Foundations of Fascial Counterstrain because we say multiple times in the class that it will give you the foundational base that allows you to go through the curriculum. So it's going to teach you the pathophysiology, which we've discussed here already to an extent. It's, we're going to teach you certain skills that you have to have. Um, we do a cranial motion test, which based on embryology allows us to figure out what systems are the most involved very quickly. And I won't get into any more than that. So that's a skill. And then being able to feel the tissue release position, which is objective, um, that's a skill. And so we gain those skills, we work on those skills, and then we give you 10-ish techniques that are in the full course for several different systems. So you'll get like 10 visceral techniques, you get the sympathetic nervous system, how to start working on that right away. We teach you the longitudinal ligaments that you saw in that, that back video, uh, the musculoskeletal class. Um, you know, we teach you some artery techniques, vein techniques for the spinal cord and how to drain some of that epidural space. And so you do leave with techniques that you can use, but the goal is to really set yourself up for future learning. Yeah. And, you know, what are the benefits for the, you know, I always think of the, the uh, business owner, right? The, the practice owner who maybe only sees like four patients a week now because they're so busy running their practice, doing all the administration, doing all the marketing, making sure their staff's schedules are full. Um, you have your own practice. You know, I run my own practice, but it's it's just me. I'm, it's very boutique kind of niche thing. So management's pretty low. Um, but what's, what's in it for the business owner who is even maybe questioning whether or not they have time to, to work on their education? Yeah, so I, I think it's, you know, the same type of things as far as job satisfaction, of course, everyone feels the same way as a practitioner. Sure. But now what you have, is, as you just use the word, you have an, a niche, okay? So you're gonna be someone who's able to take care of the difficult cases in the area. You'll very quickly be known as that person that, you know, when everyone else doesn't know what to do with them, to send them to your practice. Um, there's instant buy-in, okay? When, when you're the first one to lay your hands on that person's pain, that, that patient's like, you know what? This is, this is unique, this is different. Um, this person really seems to know things that nobody else knows, and they're going to give you a chance. They're going to come back for that second, third, fourth visit because you're the first person to really use this paradigm. So that helps retention of, of the patients. Um, it is a practice grower in the sense that, again, what you do is, is powerful and it's unique. So there is a, a self-marketing. You know, uh, we, we don't market at all. I mean, everybody comes in and it's like, you know what? does this work on this and does this work on that and we're like yeah yeah and well i'm sending you my husband i'm sending you my aunt i'm sending you my neighbor everybody's got stuff okay that no one's ever been able to address and when they know you're doing something unique and anatomical based science based um it blows up your practice to be honest yeah yeah just so just to use it just to use an example of my own practice um you know there there are five of us and I had to drop our number one pair. I mean, our number one pair uh, model, not they don't pay that, but was Blue Cross Blue Shield over here. And it was 48% of our caseload, but the reimbursement went down so low that we were basically, even if they showed up, we made no money. So, and at that time we had a ongoing 150 new patient wait list, 150 new patient wait list. Um, so, I finally said, look, I have a big heart. I want to help everybody, but we can't lose money <laughs> with a 150 new patient wait list. So I dropped, I dropped that pair. And so now 50% of our entire caseload comes in and, and pays cash for this work. And even in, in the pandemic, we're all still busy all the way through the pandemic. That, that says a lot. Yeah. Um, it, it lowered our wait list. But like I said, even in the pandemic, we still have a wait list. Right. Yeah. And I think that's probably true for a lot of the high level counter trainers around the country. Yeah. 
Um, so just real quickly before we jump in, I know I've been seeing the questions come in, so we're going to get to those here in just a second, but um, just sum up for us kind of uh, the last hour and, you know, in, in your opinion, what are the, the overall advantages of uh, factual chemistry? Well, uh, again, it's a modern pain science rationale. So we're going to teach you the pain science, you know, literally up to the month. I constantly change my classes, update my classes. Uh, update the rationale based on, tweak it based on the latest science. So you're going to be using evidence-based medicine. Um, it affects both somatic musculoskeletal structures and the autonomic nervous system. So again, we're getting into things that are, are you know, digestion and depression and PTSD. Matter of fact, there's a study being done right now on post-traumatic stress disorder from treatment through the HPA axis and the sympathetic nervous system, funded by first responders who felt such a difference with this work. Um, it expands the scope of what you can treat. So, you know, yes, you're going to treat shoulder pain and frozen shoulder, and but now you can treat trig trigeminal neuralgia. Now you can treat these irritable bowel patients and, and, you know, facial palsies, things that you would have never taken before. So it expands the scope of your practice, which keeps you, keeps you working, okay? Um, you know, if you can only treat sports medicine, there's a lot of competition for that. But people who say, yeah, I'm a trigeminal neuralgia guy, there's a lot less competition for that. So it really expands the scope of, of your practice. Um, and then I would just say, you know, painless, you, you got to throw that in there. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. it, you know, everybody says, you know, it, it works, but here's the thing. It doesn't hurt, you know, and, and uh, Tony Robbins, all you guys know, Tony Robbins, Tony is a, uh, you know, a friend and a client of mine. And, and that's what he always, he said, he said, man, the first thing you got to talk about this work is not how powerful it is. It's the fact that it doesn't hurt because everything else I do is torture, you know? So that is a major advantage. Um, and it's indirect, it's decompression, it's non-force. So we can use it on, on the 90 year old osteoporosis and I can treat an infant. And I'm not taking an infant with torticollis and cranking on the baby, I'm decompressing it. Uh, the little babies, I worked on one yesterday and the, it was a Down syndrome child who's very squirmy. And when I started decompressing some, some venous drainage in the uh, child's head, which needed to be done, he just melted and just stared into space. And, and the dad's like, oh my God, I've never seen him you know, so relaxed. And I was like, well, it feels good. He can't tell you, but he just likes where he is. Right. Yeah. They melt into it until it's no yeah. longer, until they don't need it anymore. And then, and then they start moving. And they're moving back moving. to being a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they melt into it. Well, the questions are definitely coming in here. So let's jump into some of these. I've been reading a little bit already and I'm, uh, hopefully none of them open up a, a big can of worms um, with an entire class yeah, worth, I'll, I'll try to make it class worth of discussion but yeah if, if it's out of the scope uh of the time we have i will i will say we'll move on so the first one here from uh, danny does it help to address and improve the loss of extensibility slash flexibility to, to scar tissue and contractures excellent question so it turns out fibrosis um is basically something there's a natural scarring that occurs in the body and then there's the abnormal amount which is termed fibrosis and what I was able to uh, discern over the years is that certain scars trap inflammation and become a contracted fascial scar. Other ones are a nice mobile scar. Perfect example of this would be if you look at someone who's post knee arthroscopy, two or three of those scope holes are flat. They move wonderfully. One of them is red, you know, thick, solid, and tight. That is a fibrotic scar that trapped inflammation. So we basically decompress that tissue and drain out that inflammation and it becomes a normal scar, a normal mobile scar. So scar tissue is normal, contracted edematous scar tissue to the point of fibrosis is abnormal and pain producing stimulates the nociceptors and those are the ones we target and we fix. Right, um, next question is, I'm assuming just kind of the general canostrain approach for ankylosing spondylitis. So obviously you're, you're, you're looking at a, a pathology there. And so again, we have a bucket of, of pathology and then you have your dysfunction world. You may have your diet world. You might have your, your psychosocial world. So the pathology of ankylosing spondylitis again is you know uh, idiopathic for the most part. Um, but what I've seen personally with those patients is that a lot of their pain is still activated nociceptors in many of these systems. Um, you can knock their pain down significantly despite the fact that they have this underlying pathology. And that is a key thing to understand. So many people say, well, you know, you can't cure a degenerative disc disease. 
well, how many people with degenerative dis disease are asymptomatic? Well, it turns out whatever the, your age is, that's the percent. So if you're 60, 60%, okay? So there are 60% of people who are 60 have degenerative disc disease and have no pain. So we look at those pathologies as what can we still fix around that pathology and make them more functional and less symptomatic. So I would say, I don't know that we're getting to the root cause of that and curing it, but we sure as heck can make them more mobile and less painful. In those cases, the dysfunction is causing potentially 50% of that chronic pain patient's symptoms. You knock out the dysfunction, you get that patient 50% better. That's, that's life-changing. That's life-changing. And, and people with an underlying inflammatory disorder create more dysfunction, like Ehlers-Danlos and various things. So they, they have not only what we all have from life, but they have more. And a lot of that stuff is fixable. Let's put it that way. And they're going to be glad they met you, uh, even though you may not fix the core pathology. Is the, uh, is the smooth muscle approach different than the skeletal muscle approach? The techniques are, are the same. Decompression, the tender points are distinctly different. The assessment is unique in that we do a embryological cranial scan to tell us that those systems and those points need to be um, you know, targeted. We will glide in the neurovascular bundle. So we put our hands in the neurovascular bundle and glide that structure. And then we have a diagnostic tender point on the surface. So I may go to the femoral vein and glide the femoral vein in the femoral triangle and monitor the diagnostic point for the femoral vein. Once it clears, let go, that venous vasospasm has opened up. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions here that I can answer. Uh, is this a fully online course? This uh, Fascia Foundations is an in-person course. Um, so because of the pandemic last year, we did switch up our, our teaching model, our distribution model. So Brian will be teaching a live audience uh, in Frederick, Maryland. And we'll be streaming that to St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, Woodby Island, Washington, and San Diego, California, where we'll, where, uh, we'll have um, certified lab instructors on site to manage the, the lab practicals. Yeah, um, so, so I'll, I'll have a group in Frederick, and we may we keep everyone social distance. We limit to a certain amount of people. Everyone has that one lab partner they work with. By now, a lot of us are all vaccinated anyway. Um, and then I'll do the demos, the lecture, and people like Kyle, he's always out there in San Diego, really high level practitioners who know all the techniques in spades are there for any hands-on questions. But you have to learn the skill. The, the tactile part of this technique is the skill. And you, know, you don't wanna go trying to use the technique without the skill. And I use the analogy all the time is, don't join a basketball league if you can't pass, dribble, and shoot, okay? So gotta learn the skills and then you start to play. Um, if you can't make the, the April uh, course dates, so April 16th through 18th is the first time we're running the course this year. Uh, we are working on dates uh, for July as well. Um, so just stay tuned. Uh, we're looking to get those dates and that registration opened up uh, in the beginning of March or so. Um, and I see here the discount code is LIVE50, L-I-V-E, B and Victor, 50. And you just use that code at checkout uh, to get the $50 off. Um, another question for Brian here, how receptive are pediatrics that you work with to be cranial scanned and motion tested? Yeah, they're, they're the toughest group, okay? Yeah, I'm not gonna lie to you that, uh, you know, the pediatrics, you know, they're the squirmy ones. Um, if you're a pediatric therapist, you know, you already have rapport with that clientele. Um, you know, I, I personally initially, I don't know that I was great at it when I was younger, but you know, having had kids and things now, and you know, went through the baby stage and um, confidence in what I'm doing, you know, I I enjoy it now. But they're 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 tougher, okay. Um, some of the ones that have the clear cranial involvement, um, they may be somebody that needs to be referred to somebody who's a little ahead of you in the curriculum. You know, we have high level people in a lot of areas, so you may come in and and use it on some of the spinal stuff, decompress the basic drainage pathways. And then if someone needs some of that advanced cranial stuff, you may need to refer them out for that last bit. But yeah, yeah you know, the, the squirmy one and a half year old is, is always uh, much tougher than the five year old who you can bribe into you know, staying still for a cheeseburger. So. Um, any contraindications um, like with hyperflexible patients, Ehlers-Danlos patients? Well, here, here's the beauty. It's indirect and it's painless. So take EDS, excellent question you cannot stretch them. You're not supposed to really do heavy strengthening because of the torque it puts on the joint. 
but can you do this? Can you glide their vein until it turns off? Yeah, okay. Can you position them in a little bit of flexion and turn off these neuromuscular tender points? Absolutely, it's one of the few things they can do. The beauty of releasing a dysfunctional tissue is it's pulling that joint too far in its direction. Proprioception and inhibition is on the other side. So this person's in a dysfunctional state from this hypertonicity. So when we release this by actually passively shortening it, it comes back to neutral, stops being pulled out of neutral, which isn't good for the ligaments in that EDS. And the other side isn't being reciprocally inhibited, it wakes up. So you get that stability and proprioception back to the joint. So your goals of proprioception and strength and all these things are met by getting rid of inhibition, getting rid of this reciprocal inhibition and key part, restoring the blood supply. So much weakness is due to vascular perfusion loss, arterial, okay? And it just isn't getting any ATP, isn't getting any energy. Yeah. Any concern that the vascular risk that we do is outside the PT scope? You know, I would say that you, you gotta be careful probably in the Medicare arena of, of what you say. So we talk a lot uh, just about treating the neurovascular bundle areas. Obviously lymphatic drainage is in scope, okay? So maybe on the arterial side, you could potentially say that, but I would argue the opposite. I would argue, you know, that the it being out of the scope is because a lack of skill and a lack of knowledge. Um, physical therapists and osteopaths you know, need to be able to treat all parts of the fascial system. And that this is simply a lack of understanding of people who are even all the way up at the legislative level who don't think that this stuff can be treated, that there isn't dysfunction in this area, that it's only pathology. It is not true and the research does not support that. So it is dysfunction and dysfunction is our world. Yeah. If it's a, if it's a true pathology or you can't figure out what's causing the symptoms, by all means, get a, get a physician involved. Okay, so if I do my assessment and that person's in 10 out of 10 pain and I can't find something that matches that, I'm like, look, I want you to go see Dr. Such and Such, get a diagnostic workup. We'll start working with you. But, you know, I suspect there could be some pathology here. So we are going to work with the medical community in a scientific paradigm. And we're going to become, that's, that's my goal here, is by, by getting together with these top scientists and, and researchers, I'm, this is not woo-woo stuff, okay? We're bringing this modern version of manual therapy up to the scientific level, going to figure out, you know, uh, what it can do and then teach everyone basically that these are different forms of dysfunction. And a lot of these conditions are not psychiatric. A lot of these conditions are not intractable and the scope of PT and osteopathy, et cetera, should be expanded. Yeah. To piggyback on yeah, that, I, went off. I started yeah. talking too much again. But well, it's a good, it's a really good point though, because to piggyback on that, I've had two patients um, where they came in and their level of pain did not match their level of dysfunction. So I referred them, treated them, but referred them both back to their uh, referring physician. Both of them needed surgery for cysts or, or tumors. Um, so I, I, another cool thing um, that, that we can diagnose with counter Yeah, we have, uh, and we have anatomical diagnostic points. So people come in and say, I think I tore my medial meniscus. I'll check the posterior and anterior horn tender points for the cartilage of the medial meniscus. And I'm like, no, you didn't. Yeah. Um, or you might have. Let's treat this and see how you feel. Yeah. Right. Uh, from Jennifer, are you using venous stasis to mean the same as strain? Venous strain. Venous stasis to mean the same as strain. So what the venous stasis is, is a congestion that is present due to tightening of the fascia around like pre-lymphatic channels and vasoconstriction because of sympathetic activation on both sides of the vascular bed, okay? So uh, like Dr. Shah's, one of his studies went into the you know, locus of a trigger point and using diagnostic ultrasound, you know, basically showed that the velocity of the artery was too fast because of vasoconstriction and that there was venous you know, bulging and stasis inside the trigger point because the vein is also constricted. So what happens with the sympathetic drive, which is what we turn it, turn it off on this stuff, is you get vasoconstriction on both sides, you get decreased healing in, and you get this venous stasis. That stasis allows the cytokines, which could be from trauma or infection, et cetera, to continually stimulate the nociceptors, which continually keeps the spasm, and it loops. It's a feed-forward mechanism, okay? So 
basically the pain makes the spasm and the spasm makes the pain and loop, 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 loop. And we go in, decompress it, drain it out, break the cycle. Yeah. Um, let's see, the receptors in the vascular system, uh, what are they called versus other systems? So they are vascular mechano slash nociceptors, okay? And they're in the tunica adventitia or the fascia of the vessels. So if you look up uh, research on like peripheral arterial disease, you can read a little bit about vascular nociceptors. But not, but vascular nociceptors, again, not to get in, not to fizz you guys out here, but again, they're often silent and they're more mechano nociceptors unless they have another convergent you know, problem at the same level, then they become pain generating, okay? Yeah. But they, they exist all over the place. We find latent tender points that are vascular, latent uh, ones that are muscular, et cetera. How about treating fibromyalgia patients? Fibromyalgia is, you know, again, in the research, it's not the exact same thing as, uh, um, you know, myofascial pain syndrome because they have a lot of these non-muscular symptoms. They have lots of tender points that are uh, related to central sensitization versus true trigger points. Although there is a very high correlation uh, of the fibromyalgia trigger points and tender points. So to a counter strainer, um, we treat them with counter strain, okay? We're gonna target the tender points because a lot, many of them are visceral and vascular projected points. We'll treat the trigger points because you know they have their own uh, musculoskeletal sources and we'll address them all. Getting into you know the real root of that does get into some discussion of the uh, HPA axis, you know, which is endocrine system, uh, some of the inflammatory pathways that are driven by the vagus nerve. So that's high level stuff to, to get to the source of that. Um, but I've treated thousands and, and I've, I've mapped out, I've mapped it out. So at the lower level, you're just targeting all the points. At the higher level, you're looking for that inflammatory, almost auto neuroendocrine source. And we can treat that with some of these high level techniques and these last few courses. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, Shelly, yeah, I think this video will be posted to our Facebook page um, as soon as we wrap up here. Um, and uh, that should be pretty soon too. We are running out of time with the questions. So um, I've been kind of filtering them as they come in. Um, so we'll, we'll end with one more question, um, kind of a current events question. Um, have you treated many patients post COVID? Um, any yeah. with post COVID-19 syndrome or POTS. Yep. yep. So you, you're, you're right on. And so again, anything that's idiopathic, um, we're pretty excited about in this world, okay? Because it's, it's the genetic stuff that we're not so excited about. So what you have in your long haulers or post COVID syndrome, what is, co what is COVID? COVID is a cytokine storm. It creates a, a cytokine inflammatory storm in the body and that's a systemic elevation in cytokines, which is the immune part of the, of the inflammatory uh, insult to the fascia and to the muscles, et cetera. And what it's doing is it's attacking multiple systems. It's taking your latent dysfunction that you already have. You might already have some lung stuff. You might already have some vascular stuff. You might already have some, some subtle concussion stuff. And it's cranking it up because of that cytokine storm to a whole new level. The virus is going away but now that, that insult, and it's, a, it's basically an immune cytokine insult, has just awakened some chronic stuff that you already had. So yes, I've gone in and I just target the different systems. If it's pulmonary chronic stuff, I treat the pulmonary system, you know, cardiac, pericardium, whatever. Um, they've all done very well. And so long haulers are gonna create a whole nother uh, batch of patients that will need this multi-system approach. Um, on the same note, I treated one of the physicians on the paper. There's another physician who's published about 77 times in the psychiatric area. She's on the paper. She came in yesterday, oh, two days ago, sorry. And she had a blow up of her neck and arm symptoms um, that we successfully treated years ago. And after her, her uh, second COVID shot. So when she got the headache and all the pain of COVID, her old arm stuff, woke up and she came in in a panic. Oh my God, Brian, I had this in years. <clears throat> I went in and did some new techniques that I didn't know at the time, actually. Turned it down real quick for her. But um, so even the shot has given some people a cytokine storm and brought out some of these, uh, let's call them sub threshold dysfunctions. Yeah, and I've been, I've been seeing a lot of, of vascular, uh, specifically arterial dysfunction with these post-COVID yeah. patients. Have you been seeing the same? Okay. 
All right, great. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Brian, for your time um, and your, your knowledge. And uh, let's see, these videos, like I said, they should be posted. Um, again, the Fashion Foundations course is April 16 through 18, uh, $50 off with live feed. And uh, we hope to see you guys at a course soon. Thanks everybody for the time. And I look forward to seeing you all eventually at a class. Um, you won't regret it if you uh, are, have lost your passion for the, for the profession and or want to double your passion for the profession. Come join us. We all love what we do. Have a great night, everybody.